Okay, we are conducting the interview of Christine Black. The interview is being conducted by David Morse from the Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at Wright State University's Veteran and Military Center in Dayton, Ohio. It is 2.20 p.m. on the 13th of October, 2016. Okay, so Christine, where and when were you born? I was born at Fort Hood in Texas in June of 1983. Okay. Um, who are your parents? My father was CW3 Peter Black. He retired as, I believe, the second in command of Department of Defense Investigative General after 24 years in the Army and then another 20 years with DOD. Uh, my birth mother is Anne Marie Miller Knapp. She is periodically a seamstress and periodically works in retail. Okay. Um, how was it growing up as um, as a see? I kind of know the term a military brat. Yeah. I, yeah. I I myself was a military brat. Yeah. My my dad was in the Air Force for twenty one years. Okay. So. Explain to me a little bit about how it was being a military brat. I was lucky compared to most military brats because my father was stationed at Fort Hood when I was born. And then when I was two, moved to D.C. and he pretty much stayed there for the rest of his life. Um, he was first stationed at Fort Meade when we moved up there and then he got moved to the Pentagon. And then once he retired, he retired to the Pentagon. Um, that said, there was, he had custody of me and my parents divorced when I was two. And there was a year from when I was four to when I was about five and a half where he was actually assigned to Seoul, Korea for the 1988 Olympics. He did all the security leading up to that and the security there and security post that. Um, so I was with my stepmom for that period who had inherited a two-year-old and two years later her husband got assigned to Korea. So that was entertaining. Um, but I actually, I had a relatively stable childhood because my father was in D.C. for most of that. But I remember, um, given his rank, it was an inter, like, I distinctly remember meeting the Joint Chiefs of Staffs when I was about 10 or 11, and he was working on someone's detail. I don't know who's. Um, so I grew up very aware of the power structures in the military in addition to everything else. And I think every military brat to some extent knows who outranks their parents and who their parents outrank. Yeah. But I remember being very aware of like the upper echelon of the Pentagon and understanding the civilian oversight of the military in a way other kids didn't. At the same time, my dad was very um, socially aware and very into politics. So I am one of the few people my age, I think, who remembers the fall of the Berlin Wall because my father woke me up, took me downstairs, and put me in front of the TV for it. Um, I remember Desert Storm, which is, I think, about where other kids my age start kind of remembering things, but I distinctly remember sitting in front of the TV with my stepmom because my dad was had been assigned somewhere overnight and watching the invasion of Kuwait or the invasion out of Kuwait happen and things like that. So I was very aware of those and how my dad disappeared when those things happened. Um, and I think that was more my experience of being a military brat and less the bouncing from post to post to post that so many of my compatriots have. Right. So. Wow, that's very interesting. It was. Like, I didn't realize until I was older, I went to University of Maryland, which is a very um, political science heavy school. And it wasn't until later that I understood, like, other kids my age don't remember the Berlin Wall falling. And other kids my age did not talk to their parents about when Jesse Jackson ran for president. I must have been like five years old. And I remember having that conversation with my father. So it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is. I, I vaguely remember the Berlin Wall falling. But um, yeah, that is, that is quite interesting. Um, was there, I'm really caught on this. Uh, this aspect because there's there's not very many military brats that I that I know of um, that have, that are around here, oddly enough. But um, were you very um, cognizant of the uh, as a child of I guess the um, the segregation of ranks? Um, you know the I, I guess the, the uh, what it what it was was. 
um, the policy of um, uh, the relationship between officers and enlisted? I think it may have been emphasized for me partly because my father was CID when he was in, um, so uh, Criminal Investigative Division. So he couldn't live on post, no matter where we were stationed. Um, it's one of those, those things that they do to avoid the appearance of... Um, it, it, it's basically another way to segregate CID away from everyone else and to make sure that you don't potentially have to investigate the guy that you carpool with or the guy that lives next door to you or the guy who controls your access to housing. Um, so I may have been more aware than other students, but I also grew up knowing that my dad was an officer, my uncle went to West Point. Uh, there's a picture of me at a, just under a year old when my uncle graduated. I was born in June of 83, he graduated May of 84. Um, and he's in uniform holding me um, down on the field right after they toss the hats in the air. And then their father served during World War II and was a radar man on the eastern coast of England who every night had to watch for the Blitzkrieg coming in. His father was a Fulbert colonel who was Eisenhower's aide-de-camp. And my great-grandfather was, I think, the first commander of the 8th Army Air Force. Um, so I grew up very aware of all that. And actually, when I was older, um, when I was about 10, my father divorced my first stepmother, and I moved in with my grandparents, because he also got, um, he got sent overseas somewhere at the same time. And the room that I slept in had my great-grandfather's awards on the wall, and had he was knighted by, um, by Britain, received an Iron Cross from Eastern Germany. Um, we had pictures of him receiving, I don't remember what it was, some, but some decoration from France at Charles de Gaulle's hands. And we had pictures of him receiving an award in Russia. Um, so like, and I grew up with like all those hung on the walls and like literally over the bed where I slept. So I was very aware of that portion of life. When I joined, I don't think I understood the divide as well. I definitely spent the first couple months of basic training getting smoked for mistakenly calling people sir and ma'am, and that is not what you want to call the drill sergeants in the army. Right. It's very, and it's funny because now it's very much an insult to me because I was enlisted my whole career. Like when people ma'am me, I'm like, that is not my job. No, I work, thank you. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> so uh, you have such a strong lineage uh, of officers. Um, what made you decide to go enlisted? I was an asshole to child. No. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't. I dropped out of college. I um, I was 16 when I started college. I was 17 when I dropped out. I dropped out of it for one term. And that was in the fall term of 2000. And I graduated high school in Arlington, uh, Arlington, Virginia, which is where the Pentagon is. And on September 11th, I think there were four or five parents from my school killed. Um, I didn't know where my dad was. I knew that on Tuesday morning, he normally briefed the SECDEF on ongoing investigations. Could not get a hold of him, could not get a hold of my stepmom. Our house was less than a quarter mile from the Pentagon. Um, my grandmother was back in D.C. I was living in Los Angeles at her house at the time, and we couldn't get a hold of her. Um, and I think that started the journey that ended up with me going in. But long term, like, I knew I wanted to serve. I actually wanted to be Coast Guard. And the recruiter blew me off. It was the easiest sell the Army recruiter ever had. Um, but I, I really, I had a complex in my head that the military was amazing and special and only special people got to join. And so I don't think when I joined, I thought I was good enough to be an officer. I definitely didn't have the education to be an officer and I didn't know how to get from where I was as a dropout, um, who wasn't the most, I, I was physically fit, but I wasn't disciplined in terms of physicality. Like I'd always played soccer and just always been good enough to play soccer at a high level and never had to practice. 
Um, I'd never had to do long term, long distance running and stuff like that. And I was like, what is this that you people want me to do? <laughs> um, so I don't think I really had the understanding of how to get to officer. I thought that was like a special thing for special people. And now I'm like, y'all are special in other ways. Um, but I think enlisting came in part from a desire to serve, in part from a desire to make my own way. I needed to make more money than I was making, although I made very good money, I needed to make more money than I was making and I wanted to care about what I did. Hmm. And I thought I would find that in the military. So. I, I can definitely relate. I'm making, I mean, my dad, <clears throat> he was a, uh, he was officer when he got out and um, I wanted to do, I wanted to create my own path. I joined the Air Force much like him, but I went and enlisted and just decided to create my own path. I have this feel I usually do, forgive me. Oh no, you're fine, go when, ahead. Uh, when I get asked in a job interview, I almost always get asked, well, why the Army, blah, blah, blah. And I always pull out my Army Values card. This is literally when I got in basic training. It's really old. If it dies, I'm going to cry. Um, and I always say, like, I, I worked at UPS. I was a manager at UPS when I was 20 years old. And I was making $40,000 a year at 20. And I was probably looking at making six figures before I was 25. But they gave us this big ass book to carry around, and it was uh, it was called the Blue Book, and it was all the principles of the you know, of the of UPS, and you were supposed to be able to quote it. But I couldn't tell you what any of it meant in modern day life. And so when the Army in basic training handed me this little card, and they're like, "These are the seven things we expect you to live up to," and this is exactly how they apply. That was attractive to me, like that simplification of right and wrong, that simplification of are you doing good? Are you doing service? That that meant a lot to me, especially, I mean, it still does, but especially at 20 years old when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, that meant a lot. Yeah, so. absolutely. So prior to service, you were, um, you went to college for a bit. You worked at e UPS. Mm -hmm. uh, what else did you do? Um, I was taking care of my younger brother and sister. My birth mom has two kids that are five and seven years younger than me. And so when I dropped out of college at 17, I initially moved in with my grandmother and then realized that my siblings needed a little bit of assistance. Um, it was also a situation where I was ending up like just basically being the caretaker for my grandmother and grandfather. And it was preventing me from being able to work and preventing me from being able to go to school. So it was not a good situation. And I had a family member who basically said, as long as you're there, we're going to keep pretending that everything's okay and that you're capable of doing all this on your own. Mm. So I was like, okay, so I'm going to leave and you guys can handle grandma and grandpa. So um, I moved to where my siblings were and moved in with them for a short amount of time. And then I got a house down the street and I was the one who did homework and stuff like that. And part of joining at the time the Nevada National Guard you got tuition like it was free tuition at any state school and I wasn't really joining for tuition I was going to go to school one way or another but I, it really didn't that really didn't turn to my decision but it was a good financial decision for me because it was like it's a hundred percent tuition free if I go to school and this makes the most sense in terms of what I want to do long term so see. Um, mentioned your siblings. You, uh, how many siblings do you have? <laughs> I am the oldest on one side. I am the youngest on the other. I have uh, two older step siblings and two younger half siblings. But I was raised as an only child, so I have the best of all worlds. So I have um, a younger brother and sister who are half, and an older brother and sister who are step. Okay. Uh, so. Did any of them end up joining the service? Yes. Uh, well. Not technically. My brother-in-law did 22 years in the Navy, but he's been around since I was nine years old, so like in my head he's also a big brother, so usually that's how I introduce him. But yeah, he did Navy. Um, my younger brother keeps swearing up and down that he's going to join the Army, but I don't see it happening. So I think he just wants to try to make me salute him, and I'm like, I don't think you understand how rank works. <laughs> All right, so um, talk to me about enlisting. <clears throat> what? Um, tell me the story of how uh, you mentioned you tried to go to Coast Guard. 
Um, but you ended up at the Army recruiter. Talk to me about that. Uh, so I lived in Reno, Nevada at the time, and there was no Coast Guard recruiter. So I had to take a day off of work and drive to Sacramento, which is about two and a half hours. And I had an appointment, and I got there, and the Coast Guard recruiter was like, I'm so sorry, I have a friend in town, can we reschedule this for another day? And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, so I drove back from Sacramento to Reno, and as I was coming down the mountainside into Reno, my phone rang, and it was a Army recruiter that I had given my name to like two weeks before, because I was trying to get free stuff from their table <laughs> at a career fair. Um, and they were like, hey, we were thinking, I was like, I will be there in 30 minutes. These are my AVAP scores. Um, tell me what I can be when I get there. So I showed up and I was like, what can you do for me? And um, I went and took the real ASVAB the next day and I went to MEPS two days later. Um, I didn't ship for about eight months, but I, I was signed up within a couple days. And it was just like, it was one of those things where um, I got a 99 on the AFQT, the percentile. And so I kind of felt like the Coast Guard didn't necessarily need to want me, but they should have at least respected that I was taking the day off to come yeah. try to get in there. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up in the Army and when I joined, they were it was actually kind of funny because I didn't know the difference between AFQT and the line scores. And so you see in the book they had given me, um, the line scores that I was seeing were like 110, 105, 115. And so when they told me that I'd gotten a 99 on the ASVAB, I thought I was too dumb to, too dumb to join the military, and I was really freaked out. Um, but they gave me the packet, and they said, like, this is every job in the Army. And what they had was they had the MLS code and then a description, but they didn't have, like, the name. So the first one I came back, and I'm like, I want to be infantry. And they're like, yeah, you can't do that. And I came back, and I'm like, I want to be cavalry. And they're like, you can't do that one either. I came back, and I'm like, artillery? Still can't do that one. What can I do? They're like, how about aviation? Um, and it's really bad, but I, I think I joined aviation because I had just recently watched Apocalypse Now with the scene where they kick the doors open and they play Flight of the Valkyries as they're coming in. And now I watch that scene, I'm like, holy shit, they were napalming a village. And at the time I was like, yeah, Flight of the Valkyries out the side of the helicopter. So 20 year old me was an asshole. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> All right, so, um, and this was the uh, Army National Guard? Army National Guard, Nevada Army National Guard. Okay, all right. Um, so, signed up, and you said eight months later, you then were Shipped sent to basic. basic. Talk to me about basic. Actually, the best part about basic was I had not told my family that I had joined. My birth mom knew. But I hadn't been speaking to my dad since I dropped out of college, and my dad didn't really know, and none of my older siblings did. So the one thing I'll say about basic was about week six, I think it was. So I went back when it was 11 weeks. Um, and so for my family not hearing from me for two months was not, that side of my family not hearing from me for two months was not unusual. So, and this was before Facebook, so there were no like photos to give it away or something. Um, I, about week six, we went to the med the first aid shack, and it was like a one-day course on first aid, and it was directly down the hill from the Defense Polygraph Institute, like literally like at the top of the hill is Defense Polygraph Institute, and then at the bottom of the hill is the, um, the first aid, like, training place, and they would said, like, you can be on the front side, like, towards the Polygraph Institute. Um, but don't go on the back side, don't touch the grass back there because we just replanted it. If you touch the grass back there, we'll smoke you. So I was milling around with all my buddies during one of the breaks and I happened to look up the hill and I see the battalion commander coming. And I turn back and I'm like, battalion? And then I was like, and he was coming down the hill talking to my father. And like my, my dad, had, like it wasn't until after basic training that I told my dad about this. Um, but like he didn't know I was there, but I was just like, he's gonna know my voice if I yell this. So I like went sprinting through the battalion. So first of all, the drill sergeant sees me run away from calling attention for an officer. And I run around the back and I look at the drill sergeant and I wait until he's looking at me and I jump on the grass. And he was like, okay, let me kill you now. like. That was a direct challenge. Why would you do that? 
So while the battalion commander was walking with my dad through the company, I was on the other side getting the shit smoked out of me. <laughs> and like eventually the drill sergeant asked me, like, what the fuck were you thinking? And I was like, the guy that's standing with the battalion commander is my dad. And my dad didn't know I joined the army and I didn't want to tell him like this. And he was like, just stay in front leaning rest. Like, just stay there. He's like, were you over 18 when you left? I'm like, yes, I'm 20. And he's like, just stay in front leaning rest. So he left me there until my dad left the area. But um, that and then uh, when I, and I realized my grandmother has one son who got out as a CW3, one son who was a major in the Ranger Regiment when he got out. Mm -hmm. Her husband was um, a major in the Army during World War II. Her former father-in-law is a forward, forward colonel. So my grandmother has no concept of rank somehow, despite all this. So my grandmother was the only family member who came to my basic training um, graduation. and. I'm down on the field with everyone else and we're celebrating and I feel someone tap my shoulder and I turn around and the brigade commander is standing there with my grandmother on his arm. My grandmother goes, I asked this nice gentleman to help me find you and I'm like, <laughs> So yeah, my, my grandmother had no concept of rank. <laughs> but uh, I then shipped out for AIT, which was at Fort, U Fort Useless, uh, Eustis in... It's like just outside of Virginia Beach. Okay. Uh, and I spent 10 months there learning to be an avionics technician. Mm -hmm. So basically I spent 10 months electrocuting myself on large metal cages. <laughs> How was, um, was there anything with the, the training, that, what you said, AIT, mm -hmm. AIT training, was there anything in that? It was pretty standard. There was some interesting stuff around gender politics at the time because there were, um, I think there were 30 females in my whole battalion going through training. How big was your battalion? Uh, about 800 people. Mm. And so when a female fucked up, it was much easier to put the screws on us than the entire battalion. So we had a couple of head cases because this was 2004 and, uh, 2004 they were pretty much like if you can walk talk and we don't have to tie your shoes for you you can come in um like the medical standards are very relaxed the mental standards are very relaxed they weren't double checking anybody and so we had a couple of people who like showed up at AIT and lost their bloody minds um we had a girl who was stripping for the permanent party people on the weekend and got caught um, we had a girl who had a mental breakdown and ended up in the basement um, and the drill sergeant had to like send us down there because she screamed every time a guy got near her and there may have been sexual assault involved but that I'd never heard anything about that she just hated basic training and mm -hmm. didn't want to go through 10 more months of it like as far as we understood um, we had a kid who was getting kicked out for basically being like really really an asshole just for being an asshole basically um and he sat night duty every single night for the first six months i was there and so at the time my company was housed in double wides so there were five double wides for the guys so first platoon second platoon third platoon the people who were in permanent party and then the people who'd been there for more than nine months um, or the, the people who were holdovers, so people who'd already graduated and were waiting for their, their duty station or something. Um, and then the sixth trailer, the front half was the drill sergeant's office and the back half was the females. And so he would sit in front of the drill sergeant's office all night, every night for six months, and so he would call their fire guard, like if he needed someone from first platoon or if something was going on, he'd call fire guard. And everybody got so used to, the boys got so used to listening to him that about two weeks after he went home from AIT, um, he called all the barracks and said, drill sergeant's fucking pissed, get outside now, PT formation. And so the drill sergeant comes outside at two o'clock in the morning and all six bar or five barracks of men are out there in PT formation waiting for him. And he was like, fine, you wanna freaking go? We're gonna go. Like he had no clue what had happened. Um, but the gender politics around like what's easier lock down 30 females or lock down 770 males were pretty freaking stupid mm -hmm. put it that way yeah 
So you get through AIT. Um, what was your first duty assignment? So I was assigned to 113th Heavy Transportation, a Chinook company in Stead, Nevada. However, um, we were in Afghanistan at the time. And so they were cutting orders for us. I got home in June and we were expected to ship out October 1st. I think they had shipped out like April. And at this time it was normal to do like 12 to 16 month deployments because this was 2004, 2005. Um, and basically what they were waiting is they were waiting for two more people to get home from AIT. So we were expected to go on order September 1st, ship out October 1st, if I remember correctly. Um, and while we were, like, while we were waiting for orders, we were assigned to a medevac unit. And so we were running medevac missions and we were training on Blackhawks instead of Chinooks. But it's it's the same thing, especially with what I do. They still have Blackhawks back then? Wow. Yeah. What was it? 2000? Wait, when was this? 2000? 2004. Black Blackhawks have been around since 1979. Right, yeah. They're like the single largest platform in the yeah. the military. Okay. Yeah, there's thousands of them. I thought I thought they... Uh, Are you thinking of Hueys? No, it was Blackhawks. Or they just upgraded the Blackhawks. Some of them. Some of them. They, they upgraded a lot of the, the um, MMA, or the MHs to EH or UH. Okay. But the... The UH-60 is the single most prevalent bird in the Army. Okay. Um, we do have EHs, we have MHs, and we have SHs, I think they are. Okay. Um, but, no, there's there's hundreds of them. Right. Um, so then, I was assigned to medevac duty, uh, which was a lot of fun, like a lot of intense training, but a lot of fun. And then we got word that... Um, one of our Chinooks had been shot down in Afghanistan and had killed five members of the crew from Nevada. Um, and that was when they, they were like, yeah, we're not sending anybody else until we know what's going on because there had been like four birds shot down in two days. And so they were like, we're not backfilling the unit until we get results from that. So that deployment got canceled for me. Um, during that time, I, being the really intelligent person that liked to volunteer for things that I am, ended up on a Soldier of the Year board and took Soldier of the Year for the battalion and then went to state competition. Um, and that was where I met a good friend of mine, Staff Sergeant Miranda McKelleny, and then another one, Staff Sergeant Jennifer Arndell. And Arndell kind of took me under her wing and I was struggling with PT and started working with me and started like making sure I could pass PT. And she was not in my unit, neither was Miranda. Miranda ended up sponsoring me all the way through the state level Soldier of the Year boards. Um, but they were just good NCOs who reached out and wanted to see me become what I could be. And so um, I told Staff Sergeant Arndell as a joke, because she had been offered an E7 slot in another company. But the company that she was in, she was a supply sergeant, the company that she was in was going to deploy. And so she was trying to decide between taking the deployment and staying a SAS sergeant or taking the E7 and not having to deploy. And as a joke, I said, well, if you deploy, I'll deploy. So like three weeks later, I came back and she's like, yeah, so I'm deploying. And I was like, Ooh, I guess I'm deploying too. She learned to back down from whatever you agree to. Um, so I went over to them and I was like, well, I'm, I'm volunteering. What do you need me to do? And I remember my specialty is avionics. Like my job is to rewire everything in the, the cockpit that lights up and goes beep. Mm -hmm. The company she was in was a medium transport company. So they drove big rigs. Mm -hmm. They don't have a ton of call for electronic programming. <laughs> so they're like, you're going to be a mechanic. Okay. Mm. Not, yeah. So I went to uh, school to become a mechanic. I was an absolutely horrible mechanic, as evinced by the fact that I was in country for about three months before someone showed me where the drain for the oil canister was. Because what I'd been doing for the first three months I was in country was just hitting it until it came off. And taking the explosion, oh, no. I would literally like I would strip down to like spandex and a t-shirt before I crawled under to change a canister, 
And I've been doing this for like three months before somebody saw me and was like, Black, you know there's a drain at the bottom, right? <laughs> Give me that hammer, I'm gonna go find Chewy. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I, um, I volunteered with 593rd and went out the door as a mechanic. We mo moved to Fort Bliss, Texas, middle of fucking nowhere if you've never been to their training site. It's about 45 miles outside of the city over the New Mexico border and close enough that our main entertainment was getting along the side where we knew the border was, hiding in a bush and then running and screaming la mira when the police rode past. And like our first night there, they like called us into a big circle and they're like, if you're ever out there and you get lost, head toward the lights. We have an arrangement with the prison to return you. And we're like, what? <laughs> but it's literally like they just have this facility out in the middle of the high desert in New Mexico. Um, and it was, it was an entertaining experience. Turns out that somebody like a hundred years ago bought a breeding pair of antelope to southern New Mexico and released them around there. So we were like driving one day in convoy training and we're the very last truck. We were under very strict instructions to behave because they put like six E4s in the same truck and that's never a good idea. And we're driving along like the prescribed 200 meter distance or whatever it is between the truck and all of a sudden a fucking antelope runs across and like literally like the driver just stopped and we all stared and we're like everyone else saw that, right? Like those don't belong here. <laughs> we're like we've been in the bush for too long. <laughs> so we went back and we asked about it and somebody told us like no, they like they legitimately so 200 years ago or 100 years ago somebody released a pair of breeding antelope and they've been around ever since. Um, but then, so we did two and a half months there, and then after two and a half months of training, we, uh, we moved to Kuwait, and then spent a week acclimating in Kuwait, and went from Kuwait into Iraq. And I remember my first day in Iraq, as like the back of the plane is opening up, I'm like sitting there like waiting for things to explode, because this is 2006, and this is like right at the height of the sectarian violence, and this is like right around the period the, the 13 months I was there I've been told is the highest casualty count of the entire war so I'm like sitting there like waiting for something to explode and I'm like there's no flares like are we in Iraq where are we um and I remember my my then E5 got off the plane and like smacked two flies and went like two down seven million to go <laughs> and that was that was my introduction to Iraq and then um so we get off the plane and they put us on these buses. And when we were in Kuwait, they had moved us around with buses, but they'd made us leave the windows closed because they didn't want people to be able to count how many soldiers they were moving around. Mm -hmm. So when we got to Iraq, when they loaded us into the buses, we left the windows closed because we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if we were going off post or where we're going. Um, and I remember, so my unit was out of Nevada and it was half Southern Nevada and half Northern Nevada. And we had a couple of really strong divides, one of which was like the UNR, UNLB divide. Like there, there was very strong feelings over which school was better and which football team was going to win and things like that. Um, but the Nevada, the, what a lot of people don't realize is Southern Nevada has like the single highest concentration of Pacific Islander in the country. Okay. And so like a quarter of the unit from Southern Nevada was Pacific Islander. And we had uh, Guamish, and I do not remember his real name, but we called him that because we could not figure out what the hell the word was for someone from Guam. Um, and he brought a fucking ukulele to Iraq with us. And so I remember, like, we were sitting on the bus with, like, these curtains closed. And like I said, we're expecting things to start exploding any second now because that's what happens in Iraq. And uh, Guamish is in the back, perched on top of all the luggage that we've just chucked into the back of this bus. And sitting there with this ukulele singing somewhere over the rainbow. <laughs> and so like that is like my happy place song, I always say, because I'm like, there's never been a more ridiculous moment than Guamish in the back plucking a ukulele singing somewhere over the rainbow. And that was that was my first day in Iraq. Wow. So That's incredible. Um you seen conflict? While you're in Iraq. Yeah. Um, we were a gun truck company initially. So right after we got there, 
we transitioned from driving big rigs to driving gun trucks, mm -hmm. um, supporting convoy, because this was right when they were basically like, it's not worth the number of soldiers that we're losing in big rigs. We're going to make them all commercial drivers, and we're just going to provide the security forces. Um, so a couple of ambushes, uh, one really bad rollover resulted in a leg injury for me. Um, the one I really remember, I don't remember whose truck got hit, but I remember we like pulled up in box formation, which was like the correct formation at the time. And um, I jumped out of the, the passenger side, the vehicle that pulled up on the passenger side. And we were pulling people out. And the guy on the other side was pulling out all the equipment and I was pulling out the people. And they weren't really hurt, they were just stunned, but they were kind of like floppy. So all I could do was like open up the back door of our truck and just kind of chuck them across the back. Mm. And I don't want to run outside because at the moment our fire is going over my vehicle, so I don't really want to run to the other side of the vehicle to get back in. So I just jump in across the people that I've thrown back there. And as we're peeling out, my gunner's 50 cal starts cooking off. And I had my neck like this at the top of the pile. I had four pieces of brass roll down the back of my, my shirt. And of course, my instinctive reaction was like this, which pressed my back and the plate from my IBV together. So we had to like cut out chunks of my skin to get those out by the time they cooled. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually remember that, despite everything else, is like my most painful experience in oh Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, but my battalion lost uh, only three people. Um, one of them was while I was gone on leave, and unfortunately I do not know his name. Uh, we lost Staff Sergeant Bernard in February, and then we lost my really good friend, um, Staff Sergeant Schumann, Sergeant Schumann, posthumously Staff Sergeant. Um, in May when everybody was looking for the four soldiers that had been kidnapped in Ramadi. I think it was Ramadi. I think it was Ramadi. Something like that. So. Hmm. <clears throat> so, how long was your, um, I mean, did you just do one tour there in Iraq? The first tour was August to Sep August of 06 to September of 07 and then I did two more tours um, back to back from 11 to 12 okay so how, how long were your tours um, the latter the, the first one was we shipped out actually it was funny we shipped out July 4th um, from Reno to Fort Bliss. I landed late August. Our entry date into Iraq was September 11th. And then we came home, we left Kuwait, we flew out of Kuwait on Labor Day the next year. So that was exactly 12 months. And then much later in my career, um, so I made five while I was there and then I came home. I worked full time for the military for a couple years. Um, I ended up, I'm going to back up and I'll answer the question. So I ended up returning home and getting a full-time gig with the state S1, which is the admin apparatus of the state. And the reason being is that they had this rule where like medevac couldn't be left on orders and just sit there. But you need more bodies for medevac than you need for maintenance. So if you were part of the medevac plus, you would get orders elsewhere. So I got orders to S1. So my job was, if there was a medevac issue, to go do medevac. But if there wasn't, then the rest of the time I was admin. Um, so come, that was, like I started like October after I got home. Um, and I was dealing with coming home and reintegration and all that. I had pretty decent PTSD. Although the VA says it was not PTSD, because I went to them at five months and said, I'm drinking heavily and I can't sleep at night. I'm waking up pulling guard duty in my closet. Can you help me? And they said, not for another month. But, um, so somewhere around Christmas, there was a day where there was nobody to man the command suite. The command suite was the state sergeant major uh, and both the generals in the state. 
And so they said, Black, go down there, you chew with your mouth closed, and you stand up when officers talk to you. So you go be their secretary for the day. And it was like two days before Christmas, so we weren't expecting any phone calls. Um, and so the sergeant major comes out, and he's like, what are you doing? Because he knew me. I'd, I'd volunteered for this thing called Junior Enlisted Council, so he knew who I was. And I was like, uh, mostly I'm playing a video game, Sergeant Major, do you need me to do something? <laughs> and he said, uh, go apply for college. And Sergeant Major Marty planning to start college, like, in a couple months at UNR. He was like, not that, that's that's a shitty college, you're smart, you should be at a real college. He was like, go apply for a college and I'll I'll pay for your application fee. And I'm like, not the weirdest thing a Sergeant Major has told me to do, okay. Um, so I spent the day, I got my application together. Um, and he, he actually did pay for my application fee. Um, and I applied for readmittance to the University of Maryland, where I'd been kicked out of when I was 17 and failed out of uh, my first term at University of Maryland. And sent it off, didn't think anything else about it. Um, came home, signed up for another deployment, was supposed to go to Afghanistan with the medevac unit. I had gotten a letter of rec from my former commander on deployment, and I'd gotten a letter of rec from my medevac commander. Um, so, came home over July 14th, yeah, because it was Father's Day, from some medevac training out in California, and my girlfriend and I were talking, and I had a letter from University of Maryland, and it was an admittance letter, and I was like, oh, well, fuck, because I'm supposed to deploy in two months. Mm. So, I took, a cop I took a photocopy of the letter and left it on my old commander's desk because he also worked in the building that S1 was in and I said thank you so much for writing a letter of rec. Um, I'm going to request that they defer this and I'll go back after my, my next appointment. And that commander had known about the struggle that I was having and I had been supporting uh, some of the guys from our unit that were even worse off than I was and that had been exacerbating my issues with reintegration. And so my commander was aware of all this. Um, and so like an hour after I dropped that letter on his desk, I get a phone call from the medevac commander and I'm like, because he doesn't have anything to do with me uh, in my admin role, so he shouldn't be calling me down. He's only my commander on the weekends. And he calls me down and he says, you're off the deployment. And I'm like, excuse me? And he says, yeah, we want you to go back to college. So you can either go back to college and go do something cool, or you can sit here and look like an asshole in a year when we come home. And I'm like, thanks, sir. Um, so I deferred it for one term so that I could see my unit out the door. Uh, and then December of 08, I sold everything that would not fit into my RAV4, and I moved cross country to go back to school at University of Maryland. And I was assigned to a medevac unit at Fort Belvoir, which was both interesting because it was the medevac unit in case of a mass casualty in Washington, D.C., and frustrating because no one there had ever deployed or ever wanted to deploy or understood the way the Army worked. They were just one of those units that, like, their mission was so focused and so narrow that they never interacted with big Army, as far as I could tell. Um, so I got there just in time to get put on orders for President Obama's inauguration. Um, we flew medevac in support of that, and then I discovered that the D.C. National Guard recruiter had lied to me and that they did not actually pay any benefits at University of Maryland. They only paid them at University of District of Columbia, which is not a school anyone wants to go to. Um, so I, I did one term without any National Guard benefits to, to attend school, and then state of Maryland passed a bill that said if you were National Guard, Maryland National Guard, you were automatically in state. So I transferred over to the Maryland National Guard and I got on a full-time gig with their recruiting battalion, basically working with public relations. So I would do ROTC from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. I'd go to class from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then I'd work like 3 p.m. to 11. <laughs> My life sucked. <laughs> um, but I had health benefits and I had full-time pay and all that kind of stuff. I was not going to argue with it. Mm. Um, and they let me shift days around so that I could still play rugby. And then, like, so like I would work like a Sunday, which nobody wants to work, but if you're going to let me work the Sunday and I can go play rugby, I'm okay with this. Um, so then 
in 2010, I, well, and this whole time I was assigned to an aviation unit at Aberdeen. Um, in 2010, I graduated from school, went to school to be qualified as a 15 papa, which is um, aviation operations, because that's basically what I've been functioning at as in this new unit. And then um, made the mistake of showing off in front of a sergeant major during AT. And he, I got really frustrated because they didn't have anything planned for any of the back shop people, any of the, the people that normally would sit in shops all day and work on equipment. And so I went and checked out a, um, a training facility and set up a convoy ops training and got all my soldiers licensed on the Humvee and the LMTV. And so he was like, yes, you, you should be on my staff. And I was whisked away from the nice friendly world of helicopters and into task force level command. Do you need to do something with it? No, you're good. Okay. You're good, yeah. Um, so I had ended up in that role, graduated in 2010, I'd been accepted to law school. Um, the second, the, the Friday before law school started, law school started Monday, I received a phone call from the University of Maryland saying, has the Maryland National Guard told you that they're not playing, paying for grad schools this year? And I was like, they're what not? Uh, and it turned out they had run out of money, and so they had informed all grad schools that they were not paying for N Maryland National Guard benefits, but they hadn't bothered to tell any of us. The actual so, National Guard. Yeah, so I had, I had about four hours to find about $7,000 in funding, um, and I'd already turned down all my loans because I didn't think I was going to need them. So I ended up dropping out, which ended up being a good thing because my father actually passed away that October. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up going on full-time orders with the aviation unit working. We had a mission where um, every three years there's an aviation unit in the country that stood up for a year. So there's three units and they rotate between them. And um, that is if a hurricane happens, if a mission happens, that is the unit that is the first one mobilized. Because uh, it's easier to mobilize National Guard for that stuff than it is to mobilize active duty. Uh, there's less restrictions and laws about it. So I got on orders with them for that. And then um, in March, my commander called me into his office one Tuesday morning. And he was like, hey, you know how you're 15 papa? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, do you know you're the only E5 15 papa that doesn't have children and isn't married? And I was like, no, why? And he's like, so you deploy on Monday. Um, and the unit, the, like the parent to the unit I was in, had deployed about a month previously, and an E5 had gotten injured. So he was like, can you stop in medical on your way home? And I'm like, no, because I have to go pack my life. So I went home, packed my life, got rid of the dog that I'd had for like three weeks. So bad for him. Um, he went to a better place. Uh, and deployed. And I went through Fort Dix as a quick mode spent about two weeks there and then got to Kuwait and uh, the unit was running all aviation operations in the Middle East for maintenance level operations so we were going up into Iraq and making sure things were shut down but at the same time we were spinning up operations in Afghanistan because when you have 600 aircraft in Afghanistan and 600 in Iraq, it makes sense to ship things to Kuwait. When you don't have those in Iraq, it doesn't make sense to ship things you don't need to Kuwait. So we were moving things that had previously been done in Germany to Afghanistan and reworking operations in Kuwait and all kinds of stuff. Um, mm. So I was with that unit until they went home in October. And then because law school only starts in August, I was like, well, I'm not going to sit on my butt and spend all the money that I've earned in the last six months, seven months. Um, so I volunteered to stay on with the next unit. And where the first half of the deployment, I'd been um, the NCOIC of aviation operations. So I was the person that figured out who was on duty that day, scheduled all the aircraft for the day, greeted the VIPs when they came in, made sure the pilots were all, like all their data was tracked. Um, the new unit came in and said, hey, we need an intel person. I said, well, I'm not trained in that. And they said, well, you have a college degree. And I'm like, that's not the same thing. 
so I was the NCOIC for a theater level task force for intelligence, mm. but no training. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was, and the unit was from Mississippi, so there was like all kinds of culture clash. It was a bunch of civilians? No, it was, it was they were army. Um, mm. It was uh, 1108th TASM G, Theater Aviation Sustainment Maintenance Group. Yeah, that. <laughs> wow. So, when did you ultimately get out of the army? So I came home from that really long deployment. Um, came home in late June of 2012. And I had re-upped while I was in country. Because I'd, I'd been contacted by the state of Maryland, and they're like, you need to do a re-up. And I'm like, why? And they're like, just do it. And the person who contacted me was in charge of promotions for the state, so I was like, oh, I know why. So I re-upped, and then like three days later, I got orders for my six. Um, and I'd re-upped up, re through 2015. But my original ETS when I'd re-upped had been 2013. And then I came home and magically my ETS had readjusted back. And I was like, no, I re-upped. And like, here's my form. But I was in the midst of an interstate transfer to Colorado. And I got to Colorado and they assigned me to an MP company. And they assigned me as the motor pole sergeant. And I'm like, I have no experience with this, first of all. Second of all, like, I can't even train the soldiers because I don't, like, literally the only time I have is the two months in country as a, a uh, truck maintainer because after that I'd been moved to armor and taught marksmanship for the rest of my deployment like I have no clue what to do here and they're like well that's that's where we can put you as an E6 for now and I'm like okay but I can't do this job and they'd already had an internal candidate for that so I got moved into the operations section which I liked because that was what I did was like day-to-day -day planning and things like that I really liked like figuring out if this goes wrong what are we going to do um, so I'm like, hey guys, I need to re-up. And they're like, yeah, come in Monday. So I show up Monday, nobody's there. Hey, we forgot, we're off today, okay? Um, hey, go down to recruiting, get down to recruiting. And they're like, oh, they didn't send us the paperwork they're supposed to send us. Can't get a hold of D7 on the phone. Um, and I'm like, guys, like I'm getting to the point where I have to re-up or I cannot. <laughs> like, give me my $10,000 bonus. I've already done this once. I have the paperwork. For some reason, you haven't put this in your system what's going on. Um, so while this is going on, I'm in this, this MP company that clearly does not want me there. Um, and I'm a law student. And I had, I think it was eight days straight where I got called out at 9 p.m. at night for some type of operation. And I was finally like, like a public lieutenant said, I'm like, sir, I'm not trying to be an ass. And I don't have a problem doing my fair share, but I'm not doing my fair share. I'm doing everyone's share at the moment. I'm like, I'm the only E6 that's been called in for any of this. And I'm in law school right now. And the officer looked at me and he goes, well, I mean, you're enlisted. So, like, your education isn't as important. And that's where I was like, you know what, first aren't, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take that discharge. And you can process that whenever you would like. Um, so I'm still actually, I'm looking at dropping my packet for JAG. Um, to go back in and get those last 11 years for retirement. But uh, I literally just got out because I was so pissed off with that unit's attitude, which was short-sighted in the short run, but I did everything I could to try to stay in, and they just were not helping me. Right. So, Ma'am. So um, what did you do after that? You, you completed law school? Completed law school. During law school, I took a term off and went and worked for the Coast Guard JAG, actually, which was really cool. Um, would still go Coast Guard if they would take me. Still want to take me. They take, like, four people a year nationally. <laughs> so, really, I'm not competitive enough for it. Um, but, yeah, they um, Coast Guard was very, very cool. I did a lot of operational law stuff. So, like, are we allowed to board this boat? Like whose law do we have to follow if we've arrested this person in international waters and we want him tried in Costa Rica? 
stuff that you wouldn't see elsewhere. I did a lot of military justice in terms of like sex assault, sexual assault, advocacy, stuff like that. I pretty much showed up and they were like, you're a second year law student, you're military, and you still have a top secret clearance. Like, congratulations, you're a JAG for the, the year. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so I finished up my degree in June of 2015, took the bar in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I am a bar lawyer in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Don't ever take New Jersey Bar simply because the New Jersey Bar Association will send you 45 emails a day. Mm. Um, and then for a short amount of time I clerked for a judge, so I worked for a judge who had a speech impairment, which is why I got picked up for him. Um, so I ran his courtroom for him and handled his paperwork for him. And then I got offered a position with a domestic violence advocacy group. And I went in there and really loved the work but discovered I'd been greatly misled about certain things involving benefits and funding. And decided that probably wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, and I had put in for the job I'm at now probably in June or July. And in November, right about the time I was figuring out that Domestic Violence Center was not going to work for me long term, um, Marywood University reached out and wanted to bring me in for an interview for the Director of Military and Veterans Services position. And if it had just been like rubber stamp the veterans benefits, I never would have gotten near it. But it's very much, it's very similar to what Seth does here and it's, um, I supervise a Master of Social Work intern, I supervise uh, a couple of grad assistants. I get to do a lot of programming, I get to do a lot of stuff like community advocacy around veterans and I really like it because the community that I'm in is a ton of resources at the drug and alcohol level, like veterans who have drug and alcohol issues, but they don't have a lot once you're a functioning veteran. Like if you just need a little bit of emotional support here, or if you need some help with figuring out how this translates in the real world, they don't have that. It's pretty much like if you can function well enough to hold down a job, you don't need assistance, which we all know is not true. Um, so I get to do a lot of community advocacy stuff. I work with Team Red, White, and Blue, which is a um, veterans nonprofit that's focused around veterans health initiatives. Um, and continuing the sense of service after you get out. Um, I do some educational work around LGBT veterans. And then um, I'm also a BARD attorney before the VA. So I've done a couple of arguments for comp and pen type stuff. Uh, I got into that during law school and discovered that I liked the minutia of it, but I couldn't do it all day every day, so I just do it on the side. So. Yeah, I'm sure it's overwhelming at times. It's. I'm one of those people that like if you give me a list of what you need, I will do it for you. But if you tell me I need this done and I do it, and then you say, but I forgot I needed this and then I do it, and then you forgot that you needed this, that drives me up the wall, and that's pretty much how the VA functions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, just give me a list of the things you're concerned about. Like, oh, you forgot to address this. Oh, you forgot to write this. Oh, we probably should have asked you for this. So, and this is why I can't do it full time. There's no money in it either, but. <laughs> All right, so, um, wrapping this up. Yep. Let's, let's talk about, um, what is your, well, how do you, how would you, looking back on your experience, your, your time that you served in the military, your experience in, in conflict, um, what is your, um, what is your opinion on our current status uh, on on military in general. I would not be the person I am today without the military, and in that sense, I love it. I think that it is a great force for change in certain communities. When I lived in Baltimore, a lot of my soldiers, it was the first money they'd earned on their own. It was the first time they'd left Baltimore proper. Um, it was the first chance they'd ever really been entrusted with a task and told they were capable of executing it. Um, 
I think socially the military has a huge way to go and what the military is not realizing right now is that their stance on social issues and their insistence on sticking with the, forgive me, the white male hegemony as the young woman said earlier today, I don't think they realize how much that's going to hurt them going forward. And I don't think they realize how much of what they assume is absolutely necessary is based around that thinking. Um, I guess that's that's the best way I can put it. But it's just, you don't have to be an asshole to other people to be an effective combat person. You don't have to be racist or sexist or genderist or whatever that term would be to be someone who is capable of responding to fire with fire. And I think for a long time they've mistaken just, the, the thing I always say about my students when I'm dealing with professors is you can be a dick and you can be a, P, a dick with PTSD but you are not a dick because of the PTSD. I'm like my friends who have TBI and PTSD and has resulted in a personality change, they know there's a personality change and they hate that. But if you're just a dick to people, that has nothing to do with your ability to be effective in the military, your ability to be effective in the real world. You're just getting a pass from people because you're a veteran because you might have PTSD or something like that. Um, and I think going back to my original point, we have this mindset of like an effective infantry guy is the highest point in the military and an effective infantry guy looks like Rambo. Um, but the people who get the job done, the aviation maintainers, um, the Air Force pararescue guys, um, the, the um, Coast Guard mate, or the people who jump on boats to make sure everybody's okay, like all of those people need to learn people skills and it needs to be part of our professional development. I actually wrote a paper in law school talking about how we should really be trained in negotiation and mediation as part of our professional development because they keep using the military as a state building tool mm -hmm. and you can't build a state at the point of a gun or it doesn't work. Um, and look at how our survival rates increased when we started insisting on learning local cultures and learning local norms. Um, and that needs to be part of the professional military development, not just our reaction to what's going on at the moment. That was a completely random answer, and I apologize. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, what, um, what is the message that you would give to future generations that um, would be seeing this? The military is like anything else. Um, you get out of it what you put into it. You can have an amazing career and you can have an amazing experience, but you're not going to unless you open yourself up to that and decide to see where the military can take you and what it can do for you. And if you go into it with the end goal that all I'm doing this for is my education, you're going to miss a million other chances to be educated. And as a veteran, if your only identity as a veteran is I deserve all these things that they can give me, then you're missing a million more chances to serve and to educate. And to begin a conversation with other people that will last for generations. That was very profound. Like yeah, it's deep. Dude. <laughs> All right. Um, final thoughts. Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to add that we had not talked about? I think you're good? Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you for your service.